We need sound. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everybody. Is there sound? I hear a request for sound. There is sound. Oh, okay. Just keep the words in the file. Okay. Well, that's good. It's then maybe it should stay that way. But I got a few things to say, so there'll be a little bit of sound here. Uh, I took a walk with a friend the other day and had a nice conversation. We talked about a few things I thought might be uh, good for a Sunday talk. Essentially, the conversation ended with um, us exploring some of those big questions. It wasn't a serious conversation. It was kind of just uh, uh, finding some interest in how those questions come up. Like, uh, what is the most important thing in life? Or kind of big picture questions. And I know that comes up for us in a lot of different ways. And uh, so I thought I'd explore that just a little bit in this talk. As a bit of a lead in, though, I wanted to tell a story that I thought kind of relates to what I'll be talking about here. Uh, my wife, Kate, and I had the opportunity to go to Alaska a few years ago, and we had the whole itinerary, and one of the aspects of the trip was to go up and see Mount Denali, uh, the Denali National Park. So we headed up there using a, cars, a, a car from a friend and parked there at the uh, park. And then from there, you take a bus up towards the foothills, basically, or to towards the base of the mountain. I should say there's actually not too many foothills there, but you get on this bus and um, you're taking a bus because they try to reduce car traffic, basically. So uh, we had a nice trip up there. I actually saw some bears on the way, some grizzly bears off in the distance. And the bus driver, the tour guide, was kind of given information about the park, its history, and different things. And he mentioned that I think it was maybe about 60% of all visitors to the park never get to see the mountain because it's too overcast, which was exactly the situation that we were in. There's clouds everywhere. I mean, the park is just absolutely gorgeous in so many ways, but we were within that 60%. Uh, percentile so we were not seeing much uh, off in the distance and the bus got up to the visitor center that gets pretty close to the mountain kind of viewing area and inside the uh, visitor center because of this happenstance that a lot of people don't get to see the mountain they actually have these huge viewing windows and there's a trace of the mountain kind of like an etching on the glass and you can stand on these dots. You have to find the dot that is the right height, you know, so you get lined up right. So you're standing on the um, dot that has your height on it. And then you're seeing this line off in the distance of where the mountain actually is. So it's kind of interesting, nice way to actually kind of visualize a little bit of where the mountain is. Um, and then we went outside and uh, went out on the big patio there and was just enjoying kind of uh, rolling hills and places where we would be hiking a little later that day. And a sky that was full of just a huge variety of different types of clouds. So I was sort of imagining, you know, where the mountain would be according to that visualization. And then up in the sky was... Uh, clouds of all different types of colors and shapes sort of slowly undulating across the sky. Some were darker and lighter than others. And looking up uh, pretty high up in the sky there, I saw a cloud, one of the more bright ones. And so I just kept watching the sky as, as they say, just transforming before us. In that cloud up there, was really quite bright. And I think as the clouds sort of changed, it changed size a little bit. And it was actually extremely bright at some point. It's like, I don't know if I've seen a cloud that bright before. 
So I'm just looking, you know, way up in the sky there. And it's just like completely white. And it's like, that's kind of strange looking cloud in a way. I sort of notice some very detailed aspects about it. Uh, almost like shadows. And then it hit me that that's snow I'm looking at. So it's well above where I thought the mountain would be. I'm actually seeing an ice field, like a snow field up there. And it just totally stopped me on my tracks. I was completely dumbfounded by what I was looking at. And then the clouds started clearing more and we could start to see the very top of the mountain. And then more of the mountain was revealed as uh, the clouds sort of drifted by there. And I thought I'd bring up this story because I thought it was just an interesting life experience where I had um, an expectation of what I thought that day was going to hold. You know, there's sort of actually kind of a description there for, you know, to set up this scenario of what it should be, you know, try to give a representation of the mountain when you can't see it. But when the mountain was actually revealed, it was just far beyond any expectation that I could ever have about it. And I think um, similarly, these big questions that we have in life are maybe a bit like that, where it's a big question, you know, the anticipation of seeing a gigantic mountain is kind of like, you know, anticipation of answering this big question that we might have. Um, but I think thinking about those questions, there's often elusive feeling about it. You know, what's the meaning of life? What is, uh, what is the big picture? What is this all about? Or uh, what is the most important thing? There's something that's still kind of unresolved, or we can sense that there's still always going to be kind of an interpretation with either the question or the answer that we might come up with. And um, so what I think Buddhism offers for us is to actually just see what's happening in this moment. And in this case, it could just simply be that there's this questioning that's coming up. You know, that's what's happening in this moment. We're wondering about life. And just through that awareness, just coming back to this moment and noticing what's happened, I think uh, we can see the limited nature of trying to explain things, try to come up with an answer. Um, and it's maybe a bit of an irony, I think, that while the questions aren't ultimately uh, resolvable, they're actually pointing us in an interesting direction. So uh, while I'm kind of saying that the questions are limited in some ways, or we'll never come up with a completely satisfying answer to the big questions, ironically, they are, you know, that introspection or that reflection can point us to what we really truly know is real, this experience that's unfolding in each moment. So it's not to uh, denigrate these questions or this inquiry that we have, but actually just to honor that heartfelt question and direct our attention back to awareness and experience. But we can see as in that example that, as I was saying, the questions are the answers um, are limited and just the innate quality of what that is, is um, that it's, it's, um, it's questionable. It's up for uh, to be doubted, basically, any type of answer that we might have. So in that respect, I'm thinking um, what's really happening there 
is what we're, lo we're looking for is an undeniability or a truth, something that can't be questioned or doubted. So if we see that sort of limited quality of uh, coming up with an answer, what is it exactly that we're looking for? You know, what, what's the heartfelt impulse of asking that question? And I think it is that we want to know what's true and real. And for me, I think Buddhism can be really helpful in that area when we actually realize what's behind that question to know what's true and real. And Buddhism points, the Buddha Dharma points out that what is beyond doubt is just direct experience. Anything else, um, there'll be some question. And there's kind of a beauty in that questioning too. You know, think about science or other endeavors. If science was just like resolvable, it would kind of be dead. You know, to have science constantly asking new questions and discovering new things, there's a real beauty to that. So I think also Buddhism is saying that thinking and investigation are really the beauty of the human experience. They can point us in all kinds of different directions, including looking at these deeper ways of understanding our situation. But when we really are feeling, we really want to understand what is beyond doubt, um, it's something that only we ourselves can resolve because only we ourselves can know just direct experience as it is. Nobody can give you that. It's not something that um, you can have an aha moment in terms of like reading something. It has to be this moment staying right here in this exact here now moment. But I kind of think about these things and that almost persistent aspect of, yeah, but kind of comes up like um, experience is good, but it just seems like there's something more that seems like we have to, you know, there's a way to explain what this is or am I doing things right? What's the meaning? And uh, I saw a movie recently, Asteroid City. It's a new movie, uh, Wes Anderson movie. And a few of these elements came out in the movie. I, the more I think about the movie, the more profound it seems to be. It's almost kind of confusing in different ways. And it's sort of, uh, it just has all these unfolding facets that happen. And there's, I won't spoil anything here. Actually, I don't think you could actually spoil the movie. There's no, you'll probably be wondering what happened after you get out of it, uh, if you watch it. But the movie is set up, it starts with a host of a TV show who is giving you kind of a behind the scenes, um, that's what the show is, it's a behind the scenes uh, explanation or portrayal of this theater show that they're looking at. So um, the host is kind of describing the playwright in different aspects about it. And then actually the movie Asteroid City is mostly about the play, but you're watching the play as you would a normal movie. So it's not like a theater set with theater actors. It's just most of the movie is this, this play happening just as a kind of looks like real world situation as most movies are showing so it's got these different qualities um uh and then they sort of mix different things the host will actually show up in the play and then i think there's a tv screen inside the theater play so to speak with the people watching the show so there's kind of this it's sort of circling back on itself uh, a meta type of experience and um, in a specific scene in the movie, and what I'm describing here is just the play, the movie as you watch the characters. That's most of what the movie is. 
the main actor uh, in a particular situation, something kind of shocking happens to him. So you're watching this movie and then all of a sudden he goes backstage. So you're all, you're all of a sudden backstage again from this theoretical play. And he's asking the director all these questions because this shocking thing happened. And again, the different layers, like you see the movie, it seems real, but it's actually a play. So he's asking about his portrayal in this play. And he's asking things about, is he doing it right? Um, why is he doing what he's doing? And what it all means. And the director is patiently listening to him and saying, you're doing it right. You're doing it right. He repeats it to him. He doesn't provide any explanation. He just tells the actor that he's doing it right. And the movie is really a beautiful metaphor in that sense that um, you're seeing it kind of as, again, a, what looks like a real world situation where we can kind of just associate with how our life unfolds. But then this actor asking the big questions but it's in relation to how he thinks the play should go. So for me, it's indicative of how our lives can kind of show up in a story-like way. So we'll have these questions almost like as if we're the actor asking, you know, are we, am I playing my role correctly? Or, you know, what is the meaning of this play? The screenwriter, uh, this, um, the writer of the story, what's the deal behind why these things are happening to me. So it's profound in that sense. The, the part where he gets uh, the actor, something happens to him, he puts his hand on an electric griddle, which is, you know, it's shocking. I think maybe I'm reading a little bit too much into the movie, but basically you have a play where the actor um, does something there's several things about it. It's kind of nonsensical, but then there's, for me, like the actor is actually burning himself and they recognize that the hand just got burnt. So that wouldn't happen to theater. You wouldn't actually get burnt. So again, this kind of like, oh my gosh, something's real. Something real is happening. Just as we would feel in real life, those moments of um, difficulty, where it's kind of like, this is real. What's happening? So those questions come up for us when we're um, shocked out of our usual sense of what the story is. We, we see that um, a depth of authenticity of what's actually happening. So this question, am I doing things right, was something that stood out to me in watching that movie, and certainly something that can come up for all of us. You know, am I getting this right type of question? And it made me think of our notions of what success is, failure, good things and bad things, and I read a quote from Suzuki Roshi not too long ago where he addresses this, um, this type of questioning that can come up for us about, am I doing it right? And um, particularly, this one is focused on practice itself. He's talking about sitting meditation here specifically, but I think we can uh, interpret it basically in any aspect of our life. Suzu Suzuki Roshi says, to hit the mark or to lose the mark is not different. Um, he says, it is not only enlightenment that is valuable. The failure by true spirit is also valuable. It has the same meaning. Um, so let's see here. Again, I have to sort of edit this a little. It's from a raw transcript. So 
So even though your Zazen is not perfect, it has the same meaning if you have way-seeking mind. So this way-seeking mind is uh, the way Suzuki's talking about it. It's just really being with this human experience. So he's saying that failure by true spirit is valuable. So in light of those questions that we have, are we doing it right? I think we're looking for the right way, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but um, Suzuki Roshi is, I think, helping us see that life, by definition, is this full dynamic of successes and failures, disappointments, good and bad preferences that we might have. That is all part of what life, what makes life alive. So um, a lot of the questions we have, I think, are trying to point us into what we think of as maybe in you know ideal understanding or an ideal situation or kind of a goal in some sense of getting things right, doing things a certain way, having a certain outcome. But Zen is very consistently reminding us that <clears throat> Um, the practice is not about a particular goal. It's actually about living life completely. And the Buddha, um, I think a lot of, her, of us have heard the story of him coming across an ill person, an aged person, and a dead person. And those um, situations I think can give us a clue that there's a lot of things that come up in life that we just can't avoid. It's just part of what life is, good and bad. You know, as we think of it, illness, we cannot sweep aside human life the way it shows up. So Suzuki's helping us that failure by true spirit is part of our practice. I mean, it's not part of it. It is completely what our practice is if that's what's happening. He says, um, without this big, big area, so this inconceivable world where we can live, where we can have various problems, we cannot survive in this world. So without our problems, he says, we cannot survive. And what does that mean exactly? And I think he's saying that what it, what is it exactly to survive in an in, in, inauthentic way? Or um, what does it mean to survive if our life is not fully alive? I think he's pointing to here, which would be, you know, what is your life without problems? It just seems very unnatural or kind of, has a plastic feel to it. I mean, how, what does that even mean to live a life without problems? So he says, that's exactly where our practice is. Um, without these various problems in this big, big inconceivable world, um, uh, we cannot practice, we cannot survive. I think there's another quick quote here from him. He says, um, being aware of big mind, which is, includes everything, where you live, where everything is completely involved, where everything is completely involved, then you have big, big mind and big, big trust. You are you, and you have perfect eternal freedom within this big realm. So here he's pointing to the freedom of not being tossed away by our problems and um, being gripped by the big questions, really needing specific answers. And I think, again, the aspects of these big questions when they come up are big or small, whatever they might be. Um, we don't want to dismiss them again, 
I remember a series, I think it was a, um, must have been a video series with uh, Joseph Campbell on the power of myth. And in that series, I think his main point was that the stories I we have uh, in our society, essentially, we take them very literally, and then we basically short circuit them because we are looking for a very specific sure shot answer to that. But he's saying that the myth of those stories, that they're not necessarily literal and true, or that they would lead to some ultimate answer that we can just solve all our problems with. That's where their importance comes from. Uh, so again, it's, I think, a helpful reminder to see those big questions in that flexible way. They, they can be helpful, but they're no longer helpful when we require them to do the impossible task, which is like to solve our life, whatever that would mean. Uh, so doing things better, uh, different things that we can learn, you know, that's a part of our life too. <clears throat> but we can recognize in authenticity or a direct quality that's beyond notions of good and bad or right and wrong. Another aspect of stories that I was thinking about, especially a lot of our movies have um, a moral character to them. And I think that's another big part of the big questions too. They can have a philosophical feel to them, but also I think in this heartfelt quality that we have when those arise, there's a sense of um, wanting to understand what compassion is, to understand what wholesome action is. I think we have experience of experiences of these things in our life. And um, it's sort of just, there's a ringing of freedom when we kind of, it can experience something where the turbulence sort of drops away and we can um, just have an unbiased kindness. And part of those, as I say, the part of the big questions I think are trying to get at that too. And, um, as I say, like in movies or, or different things, we'll have um, the moral of the story, so to speak. Another aspect of the conversation that I had with a friend the other day, he brought up a show that he's been watching called um, Chimp Empire. It's on Netflix. I've never seen it, but he was describing it and I've read a little bit about it. It sounds pretty fascinating. It's a documentary series where filmmakers, researchers, scientists are following the behaviors of uh, a chimp, basically society, different groups of uh, chimpanzees in Uganda, in the jungles of Uganda. So it's showing these complex social politics, uh, family dynamics, and uh, very intense disputes that happen. And um, it was uh, pretty funny. My friend said, watching the show, it seems like human beings haven't evolved much beyond <laughs> these social uh, constructs that are happening uh, real time here in the documentary. But one interesting thing that came out in the conversation is there are some behaviors um, of grooming between the different uh, members of these chimpanzee societies. And my friend was saying that what was happening there, they explained what ha is happening as kind of a hierarchical thing. So um, the grooming, which appeared to be cooperative behavior to try to help others, actually in the end was part of kind of the hierarchy. So, and I've heard this from like evolutionary biologists that even cooperative behavior, although it looks kind of altruistic is um, part of uh, survival and um, what would you call it? Uh, 
evolutionarily evolutionary advantage so it's coming back to the individual what's actually going to help them survive even in this cooperative type of uh, behavior which whenever i hear that it's pretty gloomy situation like the things that we can think of is like okay where is the altruism um, if you know we're seeing this evolutionary uh, behavior kind of just being selfish stuff but i think um, the teachings that we come across can actually resolve that conundrum like they help us resolve the big questions uh, to see that uh, our questions are limited um, so i think at least one way to really get at the core of this altruism uh, or morality is to take a look at our sense of what we think the world is according to our ideas, our storylines. And that is just um, in doing that, what we're doing is we're separating the world out into different things according to the idea. That's just how ideas work. So there's this notion, kind of this energy that um, happens where distinct different objects are all playing their part in the world, and that's what our impression is. And actually, from that <clears throat> fragmented view, um, we then now have the possibility of turmoil happening because we have these seemingly different uh, objects, people, everything competing and, um, you know, having greedy impulses, different problematic things from this viewpoint of fragmentation. So it's kind of like we hear, uh, we hear the teaching of non-substantiality in Buddhism and kind of like wonder how, what does this have to do with my life? But I think you can take a close look at it and see that uh, it's very helpful to understand that indeed the nature of thinking just simply does is this um, discriminatory fragmented way of thinking about what we think reality is but it's actually not like that it's actually complete fluidity it's beyond our ideas i think of a like a surfer who's looking at a picture of waves and maybe that surfer would say that um, that wave is the one that I would pick and that one's kind of I know is small I wouldn't want to be on that one so it's this tendency where we're picking out things you know it's just sort of what we do it's very quick in a normal thing but you know in reality the wave is completely fluid completely changing it's not different than the ocean if you're the surfer out there you probably don't even know what the wave is going to end up being i mean you start with the wave and see what it's going to be like so actual life this fluid fluidity in this movement constant movement is actually closer um, gets us closer to understanding what's actually happening it's not according to our thinking so what is really happening the truth of reality is only partially explained by evolutionary biology to really understand the core of authentic altruism is to actually understand that this world is not a broken fragmented um, world or reality those are just ideas that are helpful to navigate to uh you know determine the different things that we need to do but as i say we can get into some pretty nasty predicaments when we really hold on to our ideas there's plenty of examples like that out there but actually the true nature of what's happening is actually peace it is unfragmented reality 
in our practice can help us come back to this here now moment and actually have direct experience just be uh, to have it appear of its own accord and we can just participate real time in life as it's happening so a teaching like non-substantiality it might be um, sometimes hard to understand um, there's a lot of different ways to talk about it but maybe i would say one way to think of it is just non-substantiality is just at the most basic point is talking about awakening to direct experience. It's talking about, um, so non-substantiality is what we think of as substance, all our ideas, doesn't fully explain things. So what is beyond doubt is just experience. So we can come back to this. Um, and any notions of doing things wrong or right <clears throat> that might be useful in some different way. Um, but we can kind of hold that lightly. One other, uh, just a couple final uh, thoughts. Another thing that comes up for me is when hearing these teachings, it's kind of like, okay, then how do we do this? You know, what, you know, it's, it can end up sounding philosophical in different ways. Um, and in coming up with the talk, one thing came to mind. The phrase just doing one thing at a time is very helpful. So if you get home from doing errands and you turn off your car and then you walk into the house, normally there's this feeling that, okay, I'm done. Now my job is to get in the house. And the moment between, you know, walking down the sidewalk is kind of has a secondary type of feel to it. But we can actually do that thing 100%. So each thing that we're doing, it's one thing at a time. Uh, even if we think we're doing more than one thing, it's not. You can't actually multitask, I think researchers tell us. But um, just staying. Uh, with each activity in our life. And that can be a real anchor. Um, I don't know if anchor's the right way. It's just being here. I mean, this is everything. Every moment of our life, taking each step on the walkway is completely our life. And we can actually enjoy that. There's a depth to every moment of uh, experience and as that image of mount denali points out there's nothing like the real thing you know no matter what we think there's just nothing beyond what's true and real uh, of course that's just an example of the mountain um, but we can get we can do this practice moment moment by moment that's all I have for today. I don't know if that kind of brought up any questions at all. Any big questions for you? Or... <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Is it Steve? Yeah. yeah. Um, so the, I think actually we had something a little along these lines in your last talk in our exchange, but the, um, well, take something that most people would flinch from, like say the slaughter of the buffalo herds. And um, so the, I don't think the, the neither the slaughter nor the herd being slaughtered or the herds being slaughtered are, are unreal or they are real in some significant way and are, direct experience of the slaughter is not to, it seems to me there might be a better way to look at that than to suggest that 
the slaughter doesn't exist or the herds don't exist. So the direct experience might be um, an intimate, um, an intimacy with both herd and herds and slaughter. And the intimacy is, has some sort of um, transcendence where uh, herds and slaughter can be appropriately responded to. So, uh, so being in the moment is not to free oneself from the notion, uh, the notions of herds or slaughter. Being in the moment is to uh, respond appropriately to the realities which those notions um, divulge. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that too, because there are many urgent things past and present that we are dealing with. And uh, I guess maybe it's in line a little bit with what I was saying that um, it's not helpful to dismiss the practical things in life, understanding very serious problems that happen, that are happening. In terms of understanding the teaching I would um, suggest that whatever um, conceptual idea that we have about the different turmoil that happens in the world is actually best understood by completely understanding non-substantiality. So in other words, <clears throat> if you have the spectrum of really responding to um, this practical understanding of a problem that's happening in the world. We are much less, in my opinion, much less able to respond to that when we're very in the conceptual mode. So the more and more we can loosen and actually understand, completely understand the limits of thinking, that would probably give us the best opportunity to actually respond in uh, the appropriate way. So as you say, finding uh, a true intimacy and to know that um, a lot of the times we come up with solutions that are very rigidly formed too. So we'll actually end up causing more problems or demonizing people and different things. And that's much more in the realm of having hard, hardened ideas, not having any idea about the limits of conceptualization. But then as we see with practice, uh, it's a very gentle sort of hands, um, hands off, not hands off, um, non-striving or straining practice. So as we can do this practice, that um, gentleness I think will come into it and then it's, I'm sort of speaking in this way because I don't think we can fabricate um, flexibility of mind or magnanimity. It's just, that's a so-called um, aspect of what comes out of practice itself. So that, for me, uh, I would kind of explain that in addressing the world's problems, at least for me, the more flexible I can be see the ideas and make best use of use of them as possible, but really be ready to let go of my ideas because I, I could be wrong at any moment. Uh, so yeah, definitely it's not about saying nothing exists or um, that would just be another extreme to say that um, our ideas are completely wrong and there's, um, you know, nothing exists or go down that path. Uh, what's actually happening is this scenery, which is beyond description, 
And um, part of that is the world of conceptualization, stories, helpful things. And so, yeah, thanks for that. The, I think the word intimacy helps a bit there because that brings us back to what's right in front of our nose. I know for me, a lot of problems that I see in the world are kind of related to the things where I'm not even seeing that they're happening or I'm kind of in a complacent mode or sort of a selfish mode. Uh, so, yeah, thanks for that. Peter Wilson has a question. Okay, Peter, go ahead. Peter Wilson. Uh, Jed, you used the word altruism, and there was just something just a little brittle about it. I think it's uh, vague enough uh, that uh, you can't always tell even what it is, and um, it doesn't really lend itself to reification. It's it's too vague. Um, I as a what you were just touching on now um a, a semi a natural impulse to help people if someone's fallen you you offer them a hand doesn't you don't think about it at all you just offer them a hand and um i um i just i i am suspicious of the word altruism as it as a useful idea for practice. Um, not quite related to this, but I asked Norm once if he had any regrets. He paused for a moment. This was after class. And uh, he said, yeah, I could have been more wholehearted. And that would encompass what we might call altruism, only it's bigger and doesn't have any mm, boundaries to it. it it has to do with what's coming from you and uh, i'd like that uh, anyway that's i'm so i sorry. agree i actually hesitated using that term too i think it's kind of a i don't know the exact um definition of altruism i think it's has kind of a specific um yeah, there's a couple of different words to sort of describe different behavioral things. So I agree, it's not, I wouldn't generally use it too much, but uh, more in the sense that I was kind of talking about scientific things there. So I, I like that, Peter, a lot better. Uh, to be wholehearted, I think for me, captures a warm heartedness and a compassion is a term that also captures uh, uh, the activity of really taking care of our life. So it uh, doesn't have a specifically moralistic flavor to it, but it has an in inflection too. So thanks for bringing that up. I like you that word. You can take care of your own life without taking care of others. Uh, we are caregivers. You know, from infancy, we're the subject of caregivers and later on in life we become caregivers and if you don't you you've missed some great opportunities to um, be wholehearted anyway thank you thank you absolutely and in those moments of taking care where the notion of self and other sort of just disappears i think it seems like kind of what you're talking about caring for others and having other, others care for us. It's uh, a strong delineation isn't needed to do that. Actually, I'd say it kind of yeah, prevents, prevents us from taking care of each other when we have strong views of self and other. Susan, okay. Uh, All right, go ahead. Great. Susan, go ahead. Thank you. Um, and Thank you for the conversation that is most helpful. And I appreciate the, the most recent discussion of wholeheartedness. It occurs to me that perhaps there is uh, an analogy of 
of the possibility that our lives are not a zero sum game. When um, we were, when you were talking about chimpanzees, that um, that their need because of the hierarchy, the supporting of hierarchy, that um, that it would be contrary to uh, what we might think of as uh, as an altruistic behavior. However, I'm I am suspecting that that there is a possibility that that creatures do what needs to be done and it happens to benefit them both. And that um, that that right attitude perhaps is um, engaged in the result of that. Um, we were talking shortly ago about not thinking, just doing what needs to be done. And I, and I wholeheartedly agree that that wholesomeness, if everybody did it this way, everything would be better, um, enters into the equation. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. There's a, yeah, thank you for that. I agree. It's, um, and there's something about the natural world too, where it has, an undeniable balance to it. The, um, the evolutionary biology take is just like a tiny little slice, specifically when you look at things like ecology and how um, the balance of different species and of plants and animals and the, um, the whole thing is working together as a strong feeling me of just complete synergy and uh, animals don't have the uh, selfish impulse that uh, us humans can really take that to a new height. So it's uh, uh, kind of a limited example in some ways, but yeah, thanks for your thoughts there. Hopefully I kind of address that, but. Anything else? Just a couple of minutes left. Peter, you Okay. <laughs> Peter, is it? Yeah. Go ahead, Peter, if you got. Uh, about the, the chimpanzees and mutual grooming, um, we speak of currying favor. Anyone who's curried a horse knows that it's a very mutual thing. Um, you know, you, you have to love horses to do it and they love to, you know, I mean, it, it, it bonds. Um, it's not um, a duty or anything like that. Well, it's a duty too, but um, the, uh, the interactions between uh, individuals of the same species and even of other species are sometimes um, uh, altruistic. <laughs> they're, not, they're not just done for self-interest. Uh, you know, in, in chimpanzees, uh, you, you're deferring to the, uh, the social hierarchy, but um, that... Uh, it's not uh, an exclusive ladder where one chimpanzee and the others have to obey the dominant male. Uh, it's it all goes together. Yeah, I agree. And I think this particular show is maybe I haven't seen it yet, but at least those specific parts were kind of drawing out some stark situations. So thanks for that, Peter. That's a, that's a nice thought. It, it sort of reminds me of my bias of kind of forgetting about um, animals and their experience and just thinking about it very scientifically. You don't see that um, enjoyment happens in animals, you know, so it's not just calculating how is this going to benefit me. So thanks for bringing up that, bringing that up, Peter. It's uh, the way I portrayed it there was maybe a little scientific and stark. There's a lot of other elements 
to to consider like the horse um the companionship of that we have with that animal and so appreciate that oh we're just about at 11 so i think that'll do it for today thanks Thank you.